All right, through all the post-fight drama following UFC 270 this past Saturday, we cannot forget about what this man, Victor Henry, did on that card in Anaheim. Biggest underdog on the event against Hione Barcelos. Gets it done via unanimous decision. Outstanding octagon debut for the 27-fight pro. Victor, good to see you, man. How are you? I'm doing well, man. How about yourself? I'm doing great. So it's been four or so days as we record since the fight. How does it all feel? Like, I know you're not a guy who smells the roses for too, too long, but are you at least enjoying the momentum you've built in the UFC after that performance? Uh, yeah, man. I mean, it's, it's certain uh, life has certainly changed in a few ways. Um, but you know, like I said before, you know, you just, the things that, uh, that remain constant, such as, you know, training, uh, going to work, all those things, all those things are the same, you know, like it's just all the, uh, you know, all the new followers, all the new, um, all the new interviews, that's just, that's just icing on the cake, you know, but when we get down to it, what matters most is the cake itself, you know? Has it been like a huge jump in, in social media following? Cause I know after wins <laughs> yeah, like that, I mean, it I jumps got, up like crazy. I think, uh, before the fight, I had like something like 2,300 followers. Now I'm at like almost 13,000. Oh, so, really? Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's legit. I mean, I thought, I thought, I think it's legit. And I think, um, I know I'm I <laughs> to the detriment of me, I haven't really been active on social media. It's not really my thing, but you know, I think uh now that this is a uh a, obviously I have a bigger platform now, I need to be more responsible on my sh- social media and and get getting to people and putting more content out there just, you know, to to increase my brand, I I I suppose. Yeah, it's not something you really think of when you get into the fight game, right? You think about training no, I mean, and eating yeah, healthy you think about and training fighting. And everything. That's, that's everything that I've been doing. But, you know, I got to remember that fighting is an entertainment entertainment sport first. So if you ain't entertaining to watch, ain't nobody going to watch you. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why um, why people have, take, have gravitated towards me. Because, uh, you know, of course, like you said, being the big underdog and everything. And, you know, going up against a monster like Hany Barcelos, it was like, okay, well, how's it going to happen? And it wasn't. I mean, it was a fight. I, I don't think it was very close of a fight. I mean, obviously, I got a unanimous decision, but you know, I think I went out there and I, I entertained a crowd, and of course, I, um, I pulled off what many people uh, didn't think I could. Yeah, it was an incredible showing. And what's interesting is something that you sort of mentioned: the so-called experts mm-hmm. thought one, mm-hmm. you were not going to win, and two, if you did win, is because you're just going to wrestle them a lot. And it turned out, yeah. You didn't wrestle really at all. You beat him on the feet. The volume, the output was unbelievable. The quickness, the pressure, everything was on display. But the wrestling that a lot of people are, have you known for didn't even need in this fight. Is this the fight you expected with Hayoni, or did you think you were going to have to wrestle a little bit more? Um, you know what? Uh, I, I had two fights in mind. You know, one was he was going to overly respect me, and number two, he was going to uh, not respect me at all. Um, if he was going to overly respect me, then I'm thinking he was going to be super tentative, super, you know, not want to, not want to sit on anything. Right. So I had a, I had a game plan for that. If he wanted to go in there and just not respect me at all, I'm thinking he's going to go in there and just try to swing on me or whatever his game plan was. He was going to do it full force a hundred percent, you know? So, you know, and, you know, being the veteran and, and the, uh, and the, and the, and the great martial artist that Hamani is, he went out there and he didn't show me nothing. He didn't show me what he was going to do at all. You know, he showed me, you know, composure, his hands were tight. And, you know, of course he went out there and he, he, he was trying to put his combinations together. So in game planning, game planning for this fight, I'm thinking, okay, well, Valiev kind of not exposed him, but, you know, kind of exposed his gas tank. So I was like, okay, well, if I got to go out there, but I and I have to make him work, but I can't make him work. I can't force myself to make him work so much that it exhausts me in the process. So how, what do I do? I got to go out there and get him swinging on nothing. Give him false targets. Give him, give him something to um to fight against. So you know, go out there, be slick. You know, I didn't even need it. Like like you said, I didn't need to wrestle him. I didn't need to tire him out physically because he was physically tiring himself out by trying to knock me the hell out. You know, so, you know, in doing that, he, um, he gave up all his cards eventually. And, you know, with all the, with all the pressure, with all the counter striking, with all the, just the constant, you know, tippy taps that I was giving him, you know, eventually, of course he got super tired. Um, I did not expect to rock him in the first round. I thought I was going to come in the third round and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm rewatching the first round. I'm thinking, oh, I could have. I could have pulled back a little bit more 
just so I can guarantee I got the, you know, the, the TKO. But, you know, I let the moment get to me and I, uh, I try to overwhelm him, but in the over, in trying to overwhelm him, he grabbed me and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of known for my clinch game here in, in the gym. So of course I, I started going off, you know, knee him in the guts, knee him in the face, um, and just putting pressure on him. So, you know, like I said, props to him, man. I mean, he's just, he's a warrior all around and he's, uh, there's a reason why he has his record. And there's a reason also why people counted me out, you know, against him actually, because he's a monster. Were you, were you paying attention to the betting lines at all? Like, were you seeing the sort of disrespect the gambling community was, was putting on you because anyone who's ever watched you fight, not mm-hmm. you, like you being the underdog, wasn't a big surprise, especially against a guy like Hione, but mm-hmm. that big of an underdog, it was, it, it seemed like the line should have definitely been much closer. Were you paying attention to that at all? Not too much. I mean, you, I mean, usually what happens is, um, you know, especially in, in MMA fights, yeah, there's a, you know, there's a website, you know, you can go to and people are placing their online wagers. It's not like, a, it's not monetary wagers, but they're kind of, they're, they're, it's, it's kind of like Instagram where you say Honey or, uh, Honey or, or Victor, you know, it's people, people guess who's going to win. And you go to this one website and it says like 98% of people think Honey are going to win. And it's like, well, I'm used to being the underdog anyways, especially going to other countries and fighting for other countries, um, or fighting in other countries rather. Um, but, you know, I'm used to being the underdog. When I saw that 98%, it's like, bro, like, these are just guys that are either A, they're all Hione fans, like, they're a bunch of, a bunch of uh, countrymen just voting him up, which is cool, whatever. Um, or there's just a bunch of UFC fans that are just voting him up, which is cool, whatever. You know, you can't, you can't change, uh, you can't change people's minds, especially when they're, uh, they're a fan of just one organization and not just the sport in general, you know. Um, you know, it's, it wasn't surprising to me. So I'm just like, ah, why am I going to pay too much attention to that? I already know how it is. So what do I got to do? I just got to make sure that my, my hard work pays off and, and I do what I do. I love the first part of your media scrum when you went to the back, cause you basically said that uh, my colleague asked you the first question and you were like, he was like, how do you feel about it? You're like, I told y'all, I told y'all. Yeah. And that was one of the things y'all. you brought up. That was one of the things yeah. you brought up too. Like, you know, a lot of people should stop just just being UFC fans and look like to other promotions, look internationally, because when guys like you come into the promotion, you have some familiarity and you realize that, like, it's not just these guys who have been in the UFC for six, seven years. There's some great stuff going on uh, uh, behind the scenes. How how cool is that for you to be able to say that in front of a platform like that? Because it seemed to have gotten a lot of attention. Uh, it, it was great. You know, um, you know, I have no. I have no, uh, no problems with people being UFC fans. You know, I mean, I mean, if anything that it's, it's great. UFC has a worldwide ro- worldwide platform and it's a, uh, it's a very easy way to get into the, into MMA, but people have to remember, especially analysts, analysts, you know, MMA media, they have to remember that there's more going out there than just the UFC. If you're, if that is your, um, if that is your forte, if that is your, if that is your job, if that is what you claim to be, you know, you are an MMA analyst, then you got to be an MMA analyst. Don't be a UFC analyst. You know, there's guys, there's great guys out there like you, yourself, Ariel Hawani, who they pay attention to these, to these guys that are outside the UFC also. But then you have these other guys that are just like, oh, they only pay attention to the top 15 in the UFC. And it's like, okay, well, like you can't do that. If you're claiming to be an MMA analyst or an MMA media outlet, then why, why aren't you paying attention to everybody else? You know, you're only paying attention to one organization, but that organization has a worldwide reach. Don't get me wrong. I, I I love the, I mean, I love what the UFC has done for MMA. You know, they've given a lot of people opportunity, both financially uh, on social media, giving them a platform and they've got their fingers in all sorts of other organizations and things, but there's other organizations too, you know, from the ground up, you know, um, you know, you got, you got other leagues like Ryzen, Bellator, you know, one FC, PFL, all these other leagues that are, that are there. Maybe they don't have the clout that the UFC have, but what about the, the, the regional, the, just the regional fighters, you know, out here we have LXF, we have, um, we have OC fight club, we have true promotions or an amateur, but you know, it's like, of course you can't keep up with everybody all the time, but if you are a true fan, then you are looking to uh to see what that what that new person is i mean me personally as a you know as an as a more experienced fighter as a as an older fighter i have to pay attention 
So who's coming up in the LFA? Because guess what? They're probably going to match me up against some monster from the LFA. They're probably going to match me up against some monster coming in for Ryzen. I got to pay attention to all these all these younger guys and the guys that are ahead of me. I got to pay attention to everybody. You can't just be sitting in a room looking uh, looking forward because there's people behind you coming up on your end too. That's a, a, a very good point. I tell young media members all the time when they say, you know, what should I be doing? I say interview everybody. Like if a local promotion reaches out to you and says, hey, we have a card coming up like a half hour from your house, go to that. And if they offer interviews, mm-hmm. interview all these people because one day, one day, these guys are going to get make it big. They're going to go to the UFC. They're going to go to Bellator. They're going to fight for world titles. And they're going to remember the guys that said, nah, not interested. And they're going to remember the guys that said, yeah, I'll talk to them. And that's like, yeah. that's where it all starts. Like I, I built most of my career on talking to regional fighters and talking to like the next crop of fighter. And mm-hmm. now look at them. Now there's, there's so many fighters that, that have made that step and it's pretty surreal to see. So I, I yeah. totally understand where you're coming from. Yeah. It's funny you say that because I remember thinking the same thing, but on the opposite end, I got to give the interviews to everybody. Yeah. I got, I can't just be, I can't just wait for the super mega, you know, 50,000 plus, you know, Instagram follower media outlets. I got to give, I got to give my interviews to everybody because I got to get, I got the more hits on Google that have my name, the better for me. So everybody, you know, I'm trying to make time for everybody. I'm trying to make sure that everybody gets their time because, well, I mean, it's at this point, it's, it's the duty, it's my duty and it's the job portion. You know, like the, the fun portion is training every day and the fighting. The hard part is the cutting weight the media outlets, the, um, you know, the, the obligations that you have that nobody really wants to do. I mean, of course, everybody just wants to train, fight, get paid, go home, you know, but you know, people forget that there's a job part of this too. I had heard you would, cause I had heard you, I heard you had gotten signed a few days before the actual fight news came out for the 18th. And I immediately, like the first thing that popped into my mind after trying to confirm it, of course, was how did this not happen in 2015? How did this not happen in 2018, 2019? Mm-hmm. What was that like for you to finally get word that, hey, you say yes to this fight, you're in the UFC, you've, you're have you there. After turning pro in 2010, here we are all these years later, you just got to say yes and you're in. Well, I mean, first of all, I was eating Korean barbecue, so I had a face full of, uh, face full of deliciousness. And uh, well, I got the call and of course it was Josh Barnett who manages me. He goes, hey, uh, this guy, this date. And I said, yeah, screw it. So uh, most people would think that I would put down the uh, the tongs and stop eating so much, but uh, that's not what happened. I figured, okay, this is my last meal, so I just made sure I got my fill. And plus at 30 bucks a, 30 bucks a head, you know, I'm going I'm to make sure that I eat. So, you know, getting that call, I mean, it is what it, it, it is what it is. You know, like it's a great, it's a great feather in the cap. It's, um, it was an aw- awesome accomplishment. But having fought around the world with for different organizations, you know, it's it's just it's no I wouldn't say I'm not going to say it's no different because it is very different. But the uh, the end is the same. You're locked in a cage with somebody trying to punch your face in, you know, and it's it's just another person. You know, um, it's funny because we talk about this at the gym all the time where it's, um, you know, you can't look at the accolades of the uh, of the person in front of you because. All those accolades, all that doesn't matter until they implement it on you, you know, and none of it matters. You know, you can be, I could be standing across the cage from Peter Yan and Peter Yan is Peter Yan. He's got, a, you know, obviously he's the world champion. He's all sorts of stuff, right? He's great. His takedown defense, his boxing, his kicks, his knockouts, all that don't matter until he implements on you. And so then he's just a person with a name and he bleeds like I do. So. You know, you got to be able to just, uh, you got to throw all that out the window and, 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 and you got to prove you're the best every time. Not just, not just, uh, not just sometimes every time you go in the cage, you got to prove you're the best or at least better than the person in front of you. Did the Korean barbecue at least taste better knowing that you were a UFC fighter or just uh, Korean barbecue on the tastes delicious. Yeah. <laughs> Korean barbecue <laughs> tastes, tastes delicious. No matter what you, no matter what you do, <laughs> your dog could just die and Korean barbecue would be good. <laughs> And then you're getting ready to fight December 18th. And then we find out we got word like 10 a.m. Eastern the day of the fight that it's off. You test positive for COVID. And then you and I had spoken briefly on Mm -hmm. Instagram and you said, like, I feel fine. Like, it just kind of sucks. Like, how tough was that to get that news 
just right before it. And you have that is it, it is what it is mentality. I'm sure you didn't let it bother you for too long because something was going to happen. Eventually, we're going to get you in there. But how did you react to that? How much of a bummer was that? Um, it was a, uh, of course it was, it was a huge bummer. You know, you go in there and you cut weight, you, you stop eating. I mean, you, you don't eat Korean barbecue for about two weeks, you know, but, uh, <laughs> um, you know, it, it sucked because it wasn't only just the fight that got canceled in my mind, you know, cause I didn't, I didn't find this out till after, but how Barcelos was actually, um, his visa was coming up. So they weren't going to be able to, you know, have him fight or fly out here or whatever his traveling situation was. Um, they weren't uh, that fight might not might not have happened and in my mind i was like how many barcelos not only is a is a is, he's a great martial artist but that would be a great fight for me because if i beat him then that puts me immediately in some form of spotlight it's not just you know i told this to another another interviewer where i was like you know it, it sucks but there are people who you know they're nobody knows them in the ufc but their hometown knows them because they fight in the UFC, you know, but then there are, there's the complete opposite where nobody knows them in the USA because they don't fight in the UFC, you know, and that's what, that's what my problem was. Nobody knew who I was here, you know, while well, not many people knew who I was because I wasn't in the UFC, but you know, you put the, you put the UFC tag next to somebody's name and all of a sudden it's like, Oh, well they must be super good or they must be, they must be the next champion or whatever, you know? And, and, you know, they're, is a lot of talent in the uh, on the undercards of the UFC that nobody's paying attention to. Of course, there's a lot of hard work, there's a lot of uh, of talent, and there's a lot of great guys. But um, like I said, fighting Hani Barcelos would have been you know would have been the one that just shot me right to right into not contention, but all of a sudden it's like, hey, well now we all our eyes are on Victor Henry right now. So um, getting the news that I wasn't might not be able to fight him, it was upsetting, you know. So when that, when I, when I tested, when I tested positive, so a lot of people don't know it's it, you go, you go through three tests, uh, once before you fly out, once when you write, when you check into the hotel and then once right after weigh-ins. So you go back to the hotel, you weigh in, I mean, you weigh in, you go back to the hotel, you test and you quarantine until your fight. And that's in Vegas. Um, over in Orange County, they had different regulations because the UFC has to abide by the uh, the local government's regulations. These are not the UFC's regulations. The local government has to is what is what uh, is who sets the regulation. So, you know, when I got the offer to fight Hani again, I was like, "Yes, let's do this. Let's do this." And they were like, "Oh, well, you get you get a little bit of an extra camp." And I was like, "Well, really? Do I get an extra camp? Because it's not like they said, hey, we're going to reschedule you against Hani Barcelos.' They didn't. Nobody ever said that." They just said, well, we'll find out what, what happened. So at a certain point, I'm like, I'm thinking of myself, well, I do have a contract with the UFC, but there's no, uh, there's no guarantee on who I'm going to fight. So it's just like, okay, well, oh, oh, I, actually, I should rewind this. There's no guarantee who I'm going to fight or when I'm going to fight. So do I pull back at the gym? Do I continue at the gym? Do I continue putting myself through a fight camp and possibly be either overtrained or whatever? But it's like, no, you just, you just continue at the gym. And then when somebody gets you a fight, you know, here we go. Two weeks. Okay, here we go. That's all I had was two weeks. And, you know, a guy like Hanley Barcelos, no matter how long you train, it's always going to be a tough fight because, well, he's going to be training also. You know, it's not like he's yeah. not, he's, he's not going to be just a bum coming off the couch. So, you know, when they, when they rescheduled that fight, of course, I was excited. Yeah, it was kind of a weird situation too, because like there are reports coming out that, and I, I believe I even asked you about this, that you're fighting January 15th. And turns out that wasn't the case at all. Somehow reports were surfacing that this fight was the 15th. And we had told we, we were told that was a possibility. And then you're like, nah, dude, I didn't really hear anything that, uh, of that nature. And then turns out it wasn't the 15th at all. So were you getting no, confused yeah. I mean, too? Like, think, when the hell am I fighting? Yeah, I mean, I, I, what I'm thinking happened is that somebody assumed since that was the next UFC card, that that's when it was going to happen. and then. Somebody saw it as fact and just ran with it. And then it just spread like wildfire. But I kept telling people, it was like, according to who? Is according to this one website that is not affiliated with the UFC? Well, yeah. I'm like, well, how does that sound to you? It doesn't sound right. So I was like, so, so you have people answer their own questions. It's like, so what do you think is going on? I don't think the fight's happening. 
You're welcome. <laughs> thanks for hitting me up. Hey, thanks for hitting me up. But it all worked out, right? Because like, even if you fought on the 18th or fought on the 15th, it would have been great, especially if you're fighting Hione and get the win like that. But now you get to fight in Anaheim. You're in the feature prelim on ESPN. And hindsight's silly, but this this worked out pretty damn good, did it not? Yeah, it did. And, you know, it's crazy because I'm in the back saying to myself, 22 on 22 in 22. That was my 22nd win on the 22nd day of the year 2022. So I'm just repeating that self to myself. I'm repeating that to myself over and over again. And then I get out there and of course it's all lights and crowd and Bruce Buffer yelling at me and a gold blazer. And <laughs> you know, you go out, you know, and then you go out there and you, and you, you prove everybody wrong. Joe Rogan enjoyed your performance so much that he gave you kudos in the post fight interview. But then the next day he puts you over big time in his own Instagram post the day after the fight. And like, I, I know you don't fight for the chance to be on Joe Rogan's Instagram, but for him to single you out like that of, of everything that happened on Saturday, that's pretty damn cool. Yeah, that was legit. And like I said, you know, like a lot of people don't realize, but uh, like, well, obviously he didn't realize and a lot of people wouldn't even know it was 2005 or 2006. And, um, you know, me and my, me and my other, other friend, Juan, we go to uh, we go to a Legends Martial Arts uh, Legends Mixed Martial Arts Academy, and we're in an elevator, and Joe Rogan and Eddie Bravo walk in, and me and Juan are like sitting there, just like you know, like we're like, oh hey, dude, they have no idea who we are. Why would they? But you know, we had been watching the UFC for a little bit then, and then we're like, holy crap, that's them, and then getting to meet Joe Rogan later on in life. And, you know, Joe and I, we actually have a lot of uh, mutual friends because of that gym. You know, we got, of course, Josh Barnett, you know, we got a guy named Victor Webster, you know, and Eddie Bravo, Eddie, I mean, uh, Scott Epstein. There's like a lot of guys that, uh, that grew up um, that we, that were part of the original 10th planet system over with the bomb squad and everything. And he knows a lot of the people that I know, but it was just a, you know, it was just fleeting that we never really got to, to uh to meet officially and everything but having him having all his success all these years later and then put me over the top like that that was awesome you know i even got a shout out from chris pontius from jackass and i was like that's that's legit too because he's part of my he's part of my childhood too dude man that's so funny that's hilarious i feel like i feel like joe rogan is going to be the next generation's chuck norris you know, like there's Chuck Norris memes, like Chuck Norris will beat up trees or do whatever, like all these crazy ones. I feel like Joe Rogan is going to be because no one's going to know who Chuck Norris is in the next 25 years, like these kids growing no. up, but everyone's going to know who Joe Rogan is. And there's this mystique behind Joe, even though he's so famous, like how tough yeah. is he really? And is, is he really is legit? Could he have fought in the UFC? What, what would happen if he fought Wesley Snipes? Like all these different things. I'm waiting for him to be an unlockable character in the UFC game, man. <laughs> and get you in the game, too. Oh, hopefully, hopefully soon, you know, that'd be pretty cool. If, uh, if people want to skin, if, if people want to play as a, as a skinny guy with a tattoo or two. Most of the Bantamweight division right there, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, man. There's some, I, I always make this joke. I was like, how come every time I go way in, my opponent looks absolutely swole and ripped and I look like a string bean. Like it, it's ridiculous. Like, what is this crap? Wow, I love California, man. I, I love how when fights happen there because now we get to, we get to see the post the the, the weigh ins with what the weigh ins are the day of the fight too. It's so fascinating. Yeah. I could look at those things a million times. Oh yeah, like um, I I've had I had a fight before where uh, I walked in the day of the fight. I was one forty seven. My opponent weighed in at one fifty seven, and I was like, "All right, we'll see how his gas tank is in the third round." So. <laughs> <laughs> and I won that fight. So, <laughs> what did um what, what did Josh say to you after the fight? Is, is there anything he said that uh, that that kind of stood out? You've been to Josh forever, but after yeah, um, the first UFC win, what was that like? I mean, he goes. I mean, the first thing he says, "Good job. You did a good job doing this. You could have improved doing this." Um. So already back to the you know back to the drawing board with uh with with a coach like Josh. You know, like you did this well. You didn't do this well. You kind of let him off the hook here but you could have capitalized here. So it was, a, it's a, it's, it's a very normal thing with Josh. You know, all right, well, I'll see you later. All right, later, dude. We, uh, we host a matchmaking show on the Sunday after these cards, we make our picks and the listeners just submit a whole bunch of picks and you were a very popular name on the show. 
Mm-hmm. When when do you think you want to get back? You don't even look like you've been in a fight. Uh, yeah, I'm just normally ugly anyway. So I mean, that's just how I look. So, um, you know what? I'm uh, I'm ready as soon as the uh, as soon as UFC has any plans for me, man. So that's when I'm ready. Is there anybody? I mean, in a respectful way, of course. Does anybody stand out to you? Because, like you said, a win over Hione, you're a top 20, 25 guy on Jump Street right now. Yeah. Is there anybody in particular? Nah, they, I mean, these hands are ready to eat for everybody. They all can get it. Last thing, um, ahead of the fight, I was actually watching a little bit earlier. We reheated a, a, a video portrait of you that mm-hmm. was done by the legendary Casey Lydon and Esther Lynn. And it's so funny to see, man, you're out, you're at skateboarding, you got the dogs, you're talking about your old neighborhood and, and you were dressing with which you're trying to anyways, dress with high socks and low shorts to fit in with the older kids. And your mom had to put you in check because she didn't want that for you. This is why I think 2015, this came out. Do you remember doing that? Because it was pretty yeah. cool to go back and watch that. Yeah. I mean, I remember doing that for, uh, for MMA fighting. I remember that they, um, they came over and, you know, it's funny. Cause like I had a, like a lot of the, it's not on camera, but a lot, it's, it's habit. Um, a lot of times when there's a car that you don't recognize coming through, you know, you kind of look and see who it is. And, you know, there's a lot of that. And the guy's like, am I okay with my camera? I was like, you're fine. You're fine. It's, it's, you know, don't worry about it. I'll let you know when to run. So, <laughs> but, um, you know, the city of Southgate has changed a lot. Um, but you know, it, it, it is the same in a lot of ways, just with different people, you know, same shit, different day, I guess. But, um, yeah, I remember doing that. They, uh, they did me a solid, and of course, everybody going back to it, I'm I'm pretty sure that now they have a lot more hits than they have before. I think so, and it's fun. Mm-hmm. Oddly enough, Casey is actually getting ready for his first MMA fight. Really? Yeah, he did. Um, he jumped in the Wimp to Warrior program, and I think okay. he's supposed to fight at the uh, the end of next month. Like he's gonna have his first amateur fight. He's been doing it for oh, like very- two months. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> I wish he would hit me up. We could have got him in the gym. It's not too late. Nah, I'm gonna hit him up then. Yeah, he's gonna see this video anyways because he, he's gonna have to produce. He's gonna have to put it all together. So, Casey, yeah, right, well, listen to the band. He, yeah, he's got a he's got a training partner in me. If he wants to, if he wants to, uh, if he wants to train. Amazing, Victor! Congratulations on the win. Tremendous performance. The hardcores were proven right, and you got the job done. Huge win. Very happy for you, and and look forward to seeing you back in there. I know you're getting ready to go back into the gym, so uh, I appreciate you giving me some time, man. No problem, man. Thanks for having me, man.